Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, but it's, Thank it's you. so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what does it mean, exceptionalism? You know that Americans think that they are special. They are something else. They are rules for Americans and they are rules for another world. America is the most beautiful country in the world, the best place to live, etc. Et uh, we can speak about that phenomenon uh, on both level of government, but on the level of regular citizens. So Timothy will speak today about the roots of that phenomenon. And um, I think it will be very interesting because of the fact um, that he's been living for such a long time in the United States, both in the United States and in Europe. So he's definitely capable to, to compare those those two similar but definitely uh, different different culture. I'm glad you can. Yeah. <laughs> so Timothy, thank you very much again to be uh, on this training day uh, today with us. And I think we should thank Marco because he doesn't feel on the clothes against fly Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they will, they, they will. I will have some kind of monument one day in the front. <laughs> In the front he died of the in the line of the building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he died working on the job he didn't like. He always wanted to be a lumberjack or something like that. You're not that. supposed to tell your students in front of you that yeah, you're no, doing no. a job yeah, that you don't no, like. No. I always wanted to be a plumber or a lumberjack, something like that. <laughs> from uh, tree to tree. Yeah. And the great Canadian plumber. Yeah, the great, the great Canadian. You know that sketch from Monty Python, probably. Uh, thank you very much again. And uh, I give floor to Timothy Johnston. Timothy, you can say a little bit about yourself if you if you want. Thanks okay. again. Thank you to for the kind introduction, today. Martin. Mm -hmm. I very much appreciate it. Oh. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say. Mark always introduces me so nicely. So better than I would introduce myself because I usually don't do that and I just get down to work. So uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, there is four people here. There are four people here. Oh, no. Uh, and uh, today, and I know it was really difficult because first of all, it's a Saturday and it's 11 o'clock and there's a marathon and it's raining. <laughs> and Serbians are greatly affected by weather. Uh -huh. so, uh, and I will give this in English. I hope everyone understands. If not, is everyone here Serbian? No? Uh, except for our student from Sri Lanka. Are you really from Sri Lanka? Yeah, he yeah, is from Croatia. Sure. Uh huh. Well, I can translate into Serbo Croatian. It's not an issue if anyone has any questions. Please. If there's any major, if there's a question about a word, you can always interrupt. If there is a question, there's a question. There we go. If there is a question about uh, a longer question, please wait till the end. I suppose we'll leave what 10, 15 minutes for questions. Of course. Yeah. So. <coughs> And I think this is the fifth time I've given this lecture, at least, yeah, at least this year. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I made a number of notes, and I would like to go through them. The, the key thing doesn't want to stay on, but I don't care. Um, I would like to talk about uh, the concept of American identity. Actually, I'm not very good at making up titles, personally. So let's just call this American identity. And I'm going to address two topics that are going to address this picture which is taken from The Simpsons, <laughs> and is kind of the, let's say this is the contemporary view sometimes of America, where there is, instead of a multilateral cooperation in the world, America is seen as a giant crazy guy in an American hat, eating parts that he wants. And that may be a well-deserved um, impression, so to speak, uh, from what uh, has happened uh, in the recent, uh, in the recent decades that have passed, meaning in the past 15 years, especially with the Bush doctrine in the Middle East. But uh, I would argue, and this is going to try to present why this is actually an accurate view of the United States. <laughs> so, and why that may or may not be a good thing. So there are two concepts that I would like to talk about, but first I would like to introduce with this first concept. It is by a man named Pierre Adet. He was a very famous scientist, during his day, uh, during the French Revolution, and he died in the, uh, right before the 1848 revolutions in Europe. And he said 
upon being appointed to basically counselor to the early United States. Oh, this lecture will focus a lot on early sort of theoretical experience of the founding of the United States, but I'll bring in some relevant examples because it, that's how the United States views itself and its founding repeatedly, and we have this big mythology, and this actually clarifies much more. So I'll try to give some uh, proper examples, but I will talk a lot about sort of theoretical impressions. So, uh, again, this is by Pierre Adet, 1796. It was communicated to the French government when communiques used to travel by ships, and he's talking about Thomas Jefferson. Now, Thomas Jefferson was the third president of the United States. He, before that, he was Secretary of State and he was one of the founding fathers, noted as supposedly the author of the Declaration of Independence. And at that time, there was a divide in the American government between support for Britain, which they just had a war with, those were called the Federalists, and support for England, which was, wait, wait, uh, England and France. And France, which actually, uh, let's say, funded the American Revolution. Because those were, the two major European powers of that time, which is why half of Africa speaks English as a kind of lingua franca, and the other one speaks French, uh, and even to this day. Now, um, there was this party split in the United States in the late 1700s, early 1800s, between Democratic Republicans and Federalists. Federalists supported England, Democratic Republicans supported France. And the French were very interested to have United States support them. And Pierre Odette was in the United States and he sent back this cable. He said, Mr. Jefferson likes us, he means the French, because he detests England. He seeks to draw near us because he fears us less than Great Britain, but he might change his opinion of us tomorrow. If tomorrow Great Britain should cease to inspire his fears, Jefferson, although a friend of liberty and learning, although an admirer of the efforts we have made to break our bonds and dispel the cloud of ignorance, which weighs down on the human race, blah, blah, blah. Jefferson, I say, is American, and this is the most important part. And as such, as an American, he cannot be sincerely our friend. An American is the born enemy of all European peoples. <laughs> now, uh, this, is a, this is quite a quote. Thomas Jefferson was a, quite the achieved man. He invented items, like the dumb waiter. He wrote political documents. He was a statesman. He was a president. He was a founding father of the country. How could he be the enemy of all European peoples, like all Americans? Well, that brings us to this, and that's what I want to talk about for why this photo. If you see, it actually took a big hunk out of Greenland and, and most of Northern Europe, but <clears throat> just for fun. Now, I want to talk about this idea of why would any American be the enemy of Europe, and especially at that time. Uh, well, this is going to take us to this thing called American exceptionalism. Now, American exceptionalism is a concept that has two meanings, okay? There is a historic meaning and a modern interpretation of that meaning. And the modern meaning is that America is the best country in the whole world and the streets are lined with gold and it can't do any wrong. It is a very childish understanding of exceptionalism. Because the traditional version of exceptionalism uh, is that America is the exception to the rule, the izuzeta, okay? Because that is what exception comes from, is the izuzeta, right? And we want to think of America actually that way. Now, that's an apt concept of American exceptionalism, okay? Uh, Americans view themselves in the childish form of exceptionalism. If you talk to an American, they will constantly say that Americans, you know, America's the best country and we're exceptional and the rules don't apply to us because we're the best. That is the modern form of exceptionalism when it comes down to foreign policy, and I will get back to that. But the traditional form of exceptionalism, not the childish understanding, is that America has been an exception to the rule, which is, let's say, debatable and uh, moot, meaning arguable, but it is, uh, it's quite apt because if you would think about American history, it is the exception to the rule. It's a country founded by a system of colonies, by people who were, let's say, religiously persecuted, uh, or uh, who were religious Puritans, or who were merchants, or who were indentured servants, or who were slaves, or who were fleeing their own country for whatever reason, or da 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 da. It actually is a unique experience uh, in the historical method. Because if you take Europe, 
okay, from the 1600s, 1700s. Your, your, what you were born into, thank you, yeah. what you were born into was your future. And I can even prove this because how many here knew their great grandparents? Anyone here knew their great grandparents? Their pre baba, pre dada, pra pra, whatever. Pra baba, pra dada. Anyone? What about your dada y baba, your grandmother and grandparents? Response? Did, does anyone know their grandparents? Yeah, yes. Were their parents peasants or workers? Did they read? Could they read? Did they live in a village? They were peasants mostly. Mine, yeah. 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 Nothing wrong with that. Okay? <laughs> I'm not attacking that. That has been the historical method. There's been a great deal of advancement in the last hundred years. In America, it sought to escape that concept in the early 1700s, in the early 1600s, that if you went to the United States and you were born a peasant, you did need not die. You need not die a peasant. Now, that's, that's, that's also debatable, okay? Because it depends a lot on the individual, and then you have this thing about American exceptionalism. It's, well, you didn't win because you just didn't want it enough, you know? So there's that impression. But America was a country founded on the principle that born a peasant need not die a peasant. Born a slave, you die a slave. There, that was something that was worked out later. Um, and still needs working on. Um, and American exceptionalism was that first concept. Alexander de Tocqueville, or Alex, Alexis de Tocqueville, was a, another French uh, commentator on America. And he wrote in 1831, Democracy in America, he went and he toured America for about five years. And he wrote a book over a period of 10 years. There's a few editions, there's actually two volumes. It's very, very lengthy. And it's very funny, uh, but because he criticizes Americans as being people who can't read but have formed a government. But he really wanted this question about, okay, America made a democracy. And it didn't kill its leaders. France made a democracy and it turned into a dictatorship. How can we justify uh, sort of French democracy to make it work? And let's look at America, because at that time it was the only, let's say, concept of democracy, a representation by white men who own things. And so he went to the United States and he talked about exceptionalism. Now, he's not the singular quote of exceptionalism. I just have a limited amount of time and he has the best quote. So he says, the, the position of Americans is therefore quite exceptional. And it may be believed that no democratic people will ever be placed in a similar one, based on what I've just talked about. Their strictly puritanical origin, their exclusively commercial habits, even the country they inhabit, which seems to divert their minds from the pursuit of science, literature, and the arts. Uh, the proximity of Europe, which allows them to neglect these pursuits without relapsing into barbarism, a thousand special causes, of which I have been able to point out the most important, have singularly occurred to fix the mind of America upon purely practical objects. That's the most important thing, purely practical objects. Americans are practical people, and they're different than the rest of the world. His passions, his educations, his wants, and everything about him seem to unite and join the native of the United States earthward, da 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 da, -da to view all democratic nations under the example of the American people. Now that's, that's the end concept of exceptionalism. That's the most important part, to view all democratic nations under the example of the American people. That Americans have come to associate the concept of democracy or worldview with Americanism based on their exceptionalism. So that is kind of a hard argument to argue against because if you think about 300 years ago, if you think about 100 years ago, we did not have the concept of the world that we have now, whatsoever. And what was the concept of the world ago? There was high literacy, very strict hierarchical um, sort of forms of social systems, uh, widespread poverty, and that is not the way of the system today. There is more access to wealth than ever before. Now, that's not necessarily due to the American condition, and I'm not arguing that. Like, oh, America has made the world wealthy. No, that is the stupidest thing anyone can say. A lot of Americans like to say that, because America has this one form of looking at itself as exceptional by removing social systems and having an equality among itself that it's made the world better. No, it hasn't. But it cannot be denied that American exceptionalism, the concept of democracy, is the dialogue people have now. Whenever we talk about civil society, whenever we talk about forming democratic institutions, 
whenever we talk about rights. That is inherently a Western democratic, and it has its origins in the American and French revolutions, as well as the English revolutions of the 1640s. But that is something that has overtaken the world. So again, try and stop us. <laughs> America has, it's the modern dialogue. Now, uh, this concept of exceptionalism, are we clear on this concept of exceptionalism? America views itself as exceptional. Traditionally, historically, it has been exceptional. The Tocqueville says it's exceptional because they threw a bunch of people on a continent and said, okay, you guys figure it out. That's really what kind of happened. And their decision on making a democracy or a government, that sort of concept has formed the modern dialogue of worlds. And that's interesting, especially in the last 60 years, since the end of the Second World War. Uh, and this exceptionalism, as I said, <coughs> is uh, this sort of word that everyone uses in the United States. Uh, when we were debating health care, or we, when the Americans were debating health care in the U.S., they were talking about, well, universal health care doesn't work for the United States, because it, it's exceptional. You know? uh, people didn't really understand that. They were talking about, we already have the best health care in the world, and it's not. By any markings, it's, it's probably just as good as you know, countries in Eastern Europe, Russia. It's not very good. But people say, oh, we're exceptional, so the rule doesn't apply to us. Now, Barack Obama, to give you an idea of how important this is in modern politics and how Americans see themselves, in 2009, he was in Strasbourg on something, I forget. And he said, they asked him, do you believe in American exceptionalism? Now, I can understand the political situation in the United States is very stratified. On one side, you have crazy people. On the other side, you have other crazy people. And in between, you have people who don't really participate in politics. And he said, well, I don't really, you know, he, he didn't say, oh, I believe that America is the best country. That's what they applied. He said, I believe in American exceptionalism. Just as I suspect that the Brits believe in British exceptionalism and the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. And he was trying to say, well, yeah, every country thinks they have a good country, every country has patriots. It's actually kind of a silly quote, you know, because British people don't really have exceptionalism and Greek people don't really have exceptionalism. If you mention about Serbs that we are a cannabis nation, you know. What nation? Uh, maybe it's the United. Oh, uh, a heavenly people. Yeah, something yeah. like that. No. But I can talk about that if you would like. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. But that's the concept that every country has its own idea of being exceptional to the rule. And they, uh, he was really attacked, especially in the conservative press. But he went on, and that's going to take us to the second part from this thing about exceptionalism. So let's just, one thing. Exceptionalism is just that America has been a country founded on modern principles and not so much uh, dragged in the cage of the past, okay, due to social orders. Let's just say that's American exceptionalism. And it's democratic institutions separated. But Barack Obama, in that same speech, or in that same talk, he went on to say one other thing. I see no contradiction belie between believing that America has a continued extraordinary role in leading the world towards peace and prosperity, towards peace and prosperity, okay, uh, and recognizing that the leadership is incumbent depends on our ability to create partnerships because we create partnerships because we can't solve these problems alone. Now, he was talking about how the United States needs to work with the world because the United States from 2000 to 2008 was not a multilateral country. It was, you're with us, you're with the terrorists, as Bush was saying. Now, that, that's, that's not multilateralism, that's hegemony. And the United States gambled and lost. We did not win that. That whole administration was a joke because you can't operate in a multilateral world in, with hegemon, hegemon, with one-sided principles, unilateral principles there. And he was talking about, you know, the United States makes partnerships for uh, when it needs to. That's what Barack Obama wanted to say. Now, the thing about exceptionalism is exceptionalism does not, has not ended in this. We don't view America as sometimes in this popular way. It's like, well, Americans, they just want their oil because they bathe in it or something. Or they just want, you know, because we didn't do something. Sort of like the concept of like, why did America get involved in bombing, you know, a portion of the Western Balkans for three months? Why did that even happen? How does it get dragged into it? That's not based on exceptionalism. No, that, that, that just creates a modern dialogue. That's just something that America views itself. And Americans on, a, on an average basis, the, the Joe, sort of average Joe uh, worker or voter says, we're the best. 
America, shocking off, wave the flag. But that's not really what American exceptionalism is. American exceptionalism is that we are different, and, and it has changed the world, and maybe that's better. But now I want to talk about the thing that Barack Obama meant about forming relationships with other parts of the world. So this can maybe help Marco in his lecture later about European establishments. How, does, how do Americans view the world and uh, in forming a relationship with other countries, sort of diplomatically in foreign relationships and itself? Now, if you remember that quote I said earlier, Americans are the worst enemy of Europe, and about from Pierre Odette, and they talk about Thomas Jefferson. First of all, exceptionalism at the time would have been the worst enemy of Europe. It gets rid of privilege, the private rights of people, privilege. And America isn't about private rights, it's about you know, common law, or the rights apply to everyone. But there's this other thing, and I want to talk about that for where this comes from, and it's called, I've called it isolationist commercialism, because I have no idea what to call this. Shakespeare created, apparently, more than a thousand words. I cannot create one. You know, so I just called it isolationistic commercialism. Now, what is isolationistic commercialism? Or what is just this term? Because it's just semantics. America, Calvin Coolidge, I'm going to get this because it's funny and it will make you laugh. And this doesn't work. This laptop doesn't work. Yeah, this one is, yeah, it's probably fine. Yeah, great. Keep cool with Coolidge for president. <laughs> Campaign headquarters, Feral Ice Cream Parlor Restaurants. What is what? Uh, Coolidge was president until 28, he had two terms, so from 20, what is it, 1920 to 1920? No, that can't, no, he had one term, 24 to 28. No, 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 he had two terms. Harding died in office, 24 re-elected, 24, 28. So 1924, 1928. He was known as a president who never said anything. <laughs> and some journalist went up and said, I bet you can say, I bet I can get you, she went up to him and she said, I bet I can get you to say more than, you know, three words. And you know what, you know what he said? He just looked at the paper and he said, you lose. <laughs> So he was, he was famous for not saying anything, and he really was like that personality. But keep cool with Coolidge. Ice cream. So, I have to go all the way down here because I have some lecture notes. Now, he was talking in 1925 in, uh, actually he published something called The Address, it was called The Address of the, to the Society of American Newspaper Editors, kind of like President's Letter to the Press, and it was published. He never actually said this, and he said, what they were talking about is, is there was a good debate. It's just, you know, are you worried about newspapers publishing propaganda, right? So, like, we have that today. We go read the news, and it's like, well, this is propaganda. This is not, you know, why am I reading this? So, he was talking about free markets, a big free market person that's still around. And he said, the chief business of the American people is business. The chief business of the American people <laughs> is business. They are profoundly concerned. Now, most people know the first part of that quote, but they don't know the rest of it. They are profoundly concerned with producing, buying, selling, invest investing, and prospering in the world. I am strongly of the opinion that the great majority of people will always find these the moving impulses of our life, our meaning American, in that sense. And uh, he also had, because it's such a nice quote, as long as wealth is made the means and not the end, we need not greatly fear it, but it calls for additional effort to avoid the appearance of the evil of selfishness. So he, just to be clear, that he was saying that there are limits to one's wealth. So you know, people forget that. Um, now, uh, why do I bring this up? The, the chief business of the American people is business. That is what I'm going to call isolationistic materialism. The United States has a concept of making money. I do not know, there's this concept, you know, the average person in America thinks, you know, we're the best. The average person in America thinks that also the end all the things is, is profit. The profit motive has overtaken uh, my society. Why is healthcare so expensive? Well, every person along, it's institutionalized corruption, really. It's just every person along the way, you're just paying. And uh, that's sort of the motive that drives the American people now. So when you have an argument that says something like, well, you went to Iraq because you need oil, I said, no, 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 no. You're silly. 
We went to Iraq to sell the oil to the Chinese to make money from it. And we form relationships based on that. Right? And that is not a new thing. That is the concept that people will always have to go back to our friend. Where is that guy? Try and stop us. When we go back there, uh, that is actually how we view the world for Americans. You know, it's like, well, okay, they're trying to take over the world. Well, it's not really that way. We're trying to get a lot of money. And this is not a new thing. America was founded on the concept of mercantilism and free uh, and mercantilism, but not in the uh, not in the philosophical concept because mercantilism is actually anti-free trade. America is founded on the concept of open trade. And uh, you can see this repeated in history. Even today, the United States, uh, which you know, chairs the IMF, and says, look, we want you to subsidize us. We want you to fire people. We want a free market. Or uh, the United States, uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, ever wonder why Africa is a whole bunch of these little countries and China's a country? Uh, part of that is because the United States had enough political and economic power at the time to say, we don't want Europe to carve up China into colonies. And uh, I'm not saying America, that's the only reason at all. I mean, China's a very uh, prosperous and, and, and proud country, and, it's, and it's, it has its own strong history. But uh, it, this open door policy that the United States created of free trade is still you know, the watchword of China. So uh, we can see this everywhere. And I would like to quote Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine, does anyone know who Thomas Paine was? No? People would probably like Thomas Paine. If you're into civil society, civil order, human rights, Thomas Paine was all about that. Uh, he, was a, he was neither a founding father, but he participated in the democratic processes in the United States, in the French Revolution. Uh, he, was so, he was such a good, uh, he was so ethical that, that he made enemies wherever he went. Uh, and he couldn't be buried anywhere when he eventually died. Uh, now, he wrote a book, uh, actually it's a pamphlet. Pamphlets used to be the blog posts of their day, called, uh, they really were, uh, called uh, Common Sense. Uh, sort of like Zdrav Um, or I don't know how to translate that. Um, now, he says, how can America function independently as a country? That was, that was sort of the question. And he says, America would have flourished as much and probably more had no European power had anything to do with her. The commerce, commerce, by which she hath enriched herself, okay, she has, because it's an older English, are the necessities of life and will always have a market while eating is the custom of Europe. We might as well say the whole world. Now, why did he say this? This is, he, he one of the words that he comes back from that whole pamphlet, it's about 20 pages. Commerce, 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 commerce. He says, our plan is commerce and that well attended to will secure us the peace and friendship of all of Europe because it is the interest of all Europe to have America free for it, to have free trade. Her trade will always be a protection and her barrenness? What the hell do you mean by that? Of gold and silver security? Yeah, that doesn't matter. But the concept is, is that America was founded on the ideas of free trade and commerce. Uh, whether, you're, uh, whether you're for free trade or against free trade, I don't want to get into that. But it was founded on these concepts of free trade. And it wasn't just founded on the concepts of free trade because they believed in that. Uh, John Hancock, if you ever see the US Constitution, has this really nice hand, uh, this really nice signature, really nice handwriting. I should get a picture of that. And it's beautiful. He was a smuggler. He was, <laughs> he was, a, he was president of the Articles of Confederation. He was a governor, he was a senator. He was, very, well, he was a smuggler. If he was alive today, he would be selling humans from Africa and Eastern Europe. He was a total smuggler. Like, everything he did was illegal. He used to, and he was a drunk. He used to sleep with rum next to his bed, wake up in the middle of the night, drink half the thing of rum in the bowl, and go back to sleep. But he was a good example of who the Founding Fathers were. They were, they were merchants. They were a merchant class. They had interest in trade. The United States has been founded on trade. The United States was involved in... Uh, all trade, uh, that's what it was found in. It was a colony. The first thing that was sent back from the Massachusetts Bay Colony was a bunch of wood to build something with because they had to refund its investors. It's always been founded on trade. It's always been founded on open trade. It's always been, it's always been founded on, on making partnerships with others. And the United States, through history, has been in it for itself. 
Okay. A lot of people say, well, the United States is just interested in itself. Well, yes, it is. Every country is just interested in itself. That's been the modern concept of diplomacy for a long time now. That's the, you can apply that to any country. Well, you know, the United States, it just wants it for itself. Well, yes, yes it does. Of course. <laughs> and it's, but it's been doing that for a long time. And it's been doing that based on the concept of commerce. The United States hasn't actually, uh, hold on, I, my, my throat is very dry. There's probably those lines of weird dry mouth snot that go around your mouth when you talk a lot. Anyway, the United States has been founded on this. And this isolationistic commercialism stems from it. Now, isolationist, isolationistic commercialism can best be found as like, how about a concept of like this? I, I'm not going to go have dinner with you there unless you pay half the bill. I, I need to get something from this relationship. Or it's like, I don't know, let's all chip in for a present for their party. You know, America actually is not interested in creating these sort of like uh, relationships that are long standing with other countries. It's only interested in what it can get from its own interests. And this is not like a new concept. George Washington. George Washington uh, was president until 1796. And contrary to popular belief, he didn't willfully step down. They formed a, tra a treaty called the John Jay Treaty. It's actually not the real name of it, but it's what it's known as. And it basically was the finalized treaty between Britain and the United States. And uh, George Washington favored a favorable British stance at that time. Like we had before with Jefferson. He favored France. Um, but the, uh, the, the problem was is that that gave Britain many rights that America had to give up to secure a sort of commercial trade. And he was essentially forced out of office. It's sort of like the dirty secret of George Washington's life. Uh, but in a farewell address, which he never made, this was actually published in the Philadelphia Herald Examiner? I forget the name of the paper at the time. He said this, and it's, it's been very misinterpreted, but it's a very good concept of what, um, how America sees itself in the world. Um, the great rule of conduct for us, for America, in regard to foreign nations is in extending our commercial relations to have with them as little political connection as possible. So far as we have already formed engagements, let them be fulfilled with perfect good faith. Here, let us stop. Europe, meaning the rest of the world really, has a set of primary interests which to us have not, or a very remote relation. Hence, she must be engaged in frequent controversies, the causes of which are essentially foreign to our concerns. Hence, it likes hence, therefore, which is like saying zato zato, it must be unwise in us to implicate ourselves by artificial ties in the ordinary vicissitudes, disagreements, of her politics, or the ordinary combinations and collisions of her friendships or enmities. Now, what does that mean? Because it's just this old thing. George, by the way, in case no one knows, George Washington was the founding father of the United States. He was the first president. He was a terrible general, but he was a great statesman. Um, he's saying here, and, and this quote is very famous in the U.S. This quote is always famous when cited for isolationism. But it's always misunderstood. People take this and be like, do not make alliances. We're on our own, and we're, we're better than others. Like that exceptional rule. It actually doesn't say that. If you read it, it says, the concerns of Europe in its fighting between kings has nothing to do with our concerns because we're a commercial country. That's what his farewell address is. And we need not form permanent ties to fulfill our commercial interests. And if you think about that, that is very applicable even to today. So the United States, who should I pick? Oh, I don't know. What country did the United States support that had a political dictator against its own principles? The United States are they're ethical, principled people in some way. They believe in liberty and democracy and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, they have supported dictator after dictator after dictator. How about we'll take Allende and we'll take Pinochet in Chile. In the 70s, uh, the United States just got rid of, a, of, a, of, a, of someone who was elected who was a moderate leftist uh, in Chile. And he didn't really win. He won with a plurality with like 11%. He wasn't very popular. And they got rid of him. The CIA basically instituted a coup through various channels to put in uh, a dictator, a tyrant, Pinochet, 
And he killed thousands upon thousands of people because Chile, if you guys don't know, has some of the best copper mines in the whole world and it never rains. And that part of Chile, it didn't rain for like 100 years once. And it's just wonderful to do business in. And the United States invested uh, a small amount of money just to make sure you know, that it didn't kind of nationalize its copper industry. They can talk about the domino theory and preventing things from the Cold War, but it was for that. In Guatemala in 1953, they got rid of the Arbenz government because he nationalized small parts of territory that were possessed by the United Fruit Company, uh, an American company, United Fruits, that just basically grow bananas. Ever heard the term banana republic? Yeah. People like to say some countries are banana republics, and they say, no, 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 they don't have any bananas. They don't have anything of value. You have to have something of value to be a banana republic. Um, or let's talk about, oh, we don't have to do go that far back to look at uh, the Dayton Accords. So the Dayton Accords, you have Milosevic, Tuchman, Zbigetto, Vizbjovic, I can never pronounce his name, and they're all shaking hands. They're all, they're all dictators, they're all dictators. Tuchman, Zbigetovic, and Milosevic were all dictators, the end. They were maybe criminal dictators, or we can classify them in some way, and you can be for or against them, but they, the United States decided we're gonna work with them. You know, oh yeah, 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 we know that we didn't really solve the problem, but you know, we have a nice treaty to sign and we're gonna use that for now. It was in their own interest. They wanted to end the civil strife. In 1983, the United States gave chemical weapons to Iraq, because, actually, 84? Donald Rumsfeld met with Saddam Hussein in 83, 84, when he was a counselor in the Secretary of State Department. And then we removed Saddam Hussein from power. These affect our commercial interests, that's what. Uh, the 1990, Gulf War, 1990, 1991, was to secure Kuwaiti oil fields and prop up the Saudi government in Saudi Arabia because it's one of our main trading partners. Oh, one of the greatest even, achievements. Even, even be, I'm yeah. sorry, even before that, yeah. which is uh, very important to the United States is supported Mujahideen movement in Afghanistan against uh, Charlie Wilson the war, yes. uh, yeah. against uh, Soviet Union in that period, and uh, actually they made Osama bin Laden to. Actually, to be fair, they supported the Mujahideen, and the Mujahideen yeah, yes. are then, the more yes, secular yeah, they, forms. The Taliban, yes, which is in yes. eastern Pakistan. Yes, but that was the, 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 that was the root of the, the whole movement, which um, attacked the yeah. United States in 2001. Yes, that is true. Yeah. And, and it's the, but it's more about they supported the Mujahideen, which were part of groups that formed with the Taliban, which was in western Pakistan, and blah, 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 blah. blah. Or the best example, which is, see, now, now I forgot what was going to, oh, in 1942, 43, uh, before World War II, they discovered a lot of oil in Saudi Arabia, like a lot of oil, a lot. <laughs> and it's still to this day. And the United, the United States researchers for, I forget which oil company, kind of, I think it was, a sh it wasn't Shell, I think it was the United Oil, I forget, I really forget. Uh, during the middle of the war, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had the Shah, no, not the Shah, I'm sorry, that's for Iran, had the sheik, the main sheik of basically what was the Mecca city state of Saudi Arabia flown out to a large naval cruiser and they talked. And the United States says, look, let us harvest your oil, you know, and uh, we'll give you a military protection. They formed an alliance based on that. And to show you how much the United States is, is interested in commercial interests, that the, the, the sheik of that time was very old, it was hard for him to walk, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he, he, was a, he had polio and he couldn't walk, a poor man. And he, and the, the, uh, the sheik said, you know, I really like your wheelchair, the interpreter translated, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, oh, take the wheelchair. <laughs> you know, now, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a very nice man, and I have no doubt that he said, take the wheelchair, because he knew it was probably hard for that guy, for that other man to get around in heaven in a wheelchair. But still, to this day, the United States uh, is very militarily invested in Saudi Arabia's <clears throat> commercial interests. Now, uh, I have just a few more moments. Uh, George Washington, in that farewell address, he says, one last thing I highlighted it is, it, it is our true policy to steer clear, which is a nice phrase, of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world. So far, I mean, as we are now at liberty to do it, for let me not be understood as capable of 
patronizing infidelity, da 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 da. Taking care always to keep ourselves, da 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 da. da. Where's the thing about commercialism? Uh, but even our commercial policy should hold an equal and impartial hand, neither seeking nor granting exclusive favors or preferences. That's the second part. Commercialism for all, no favored nation status. And that is where we get to try and stop us. That's where that comes from. And, and that really drives uh, America. Yeah, it's, uh, I can talk about how that's detrimental. This was actually not new uh, to Washington. Much earlier, he said in a letter to a, a man named Governor Morris. Now, he wasn't a governor. His name was Governor Morris. Mm. Right? Uh, and he never became governor, either. Mm. So, <laughs> so, my policy has been and will continue to be, while I have the honor to remain in the, in the administration of government, to be upon friendly terms with, but independent of all nations of the earth, to share the broils of none, to fulfill our own engagements, to supply the wants and the carries for them all, being thoroughly convinced that is in our policy and interest to do so. Blah, 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 blah. Maybe it's also interesting, Timothy, to, to mention that famous uh, farewell speech uh, from uh, by Isaac Auer in 1958, something like that, uh, because he mentioned uh, the, the biggest threat. 60. 1960, 60. just before he, he was just before Kennedy, I think. I really hope 16, yeah. Hold yeah. On. But maybe even even before that. Uh, Never mind. I get, I get, I get really, As you all know, White Eisenhower was a famous general from the Second World War and military man. Mm -hmm. And after that, uh, he went into politics and. Uh, oh, you're right, 58. You were right, 58. Yeah. yeah. And he won two elections, two terms. Mm -hmm. And in his farewell speech, which is very short, maybe a few minutes. I'm not sure whether we will have the opportunity today from this computer to see. He warned that uh, the biggest threat for the United States and for the free world is military industrial complex, which was so uh, stunning because he was a military man. He came from that background and he was right. Mm. He, he said that that combination of uh, military uh, in industry, actually military industrial complex, uh, it's getting bigger and bigger and it's Well, actually, I, I, I can connect that to this concept of uh, isolationistic commercialism. It's mm -hmm. just that Eisenhower was very, uh, Eisenhower was a, 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 great, a, great, a great statesman and general. Generals are never remembered for being generals. You have to become a statesman to be a general, uh, to, be, to be remembered. Just to prove that I can say, can anyone here remember a famous general from Serbia from World War One. There's a whole bunch of streets named after them. There's a parks named after them. Can anyone name like?